turn the meeting over to your host. Sir, you may begin. Thank you very much, Operator. Uh, good afternoon. This is Gene Carpenter. I am an agency facilitator with the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, my apologies for the delay in starting the uh, meeting today. Uh, also with me is Dr. Donna Beth Howe, uh, who will be giving a presentation. This is a meeting for sodium iodine I-131 patient release information collection. Uh, what we're looking for here is to give uh, you, the listeners, an overview of the various materials that have been put out in the Federal Register and, how, uh, and also to answer questions on how to provide uh, information back for the information collection portion of it uh, and also any other questions that you might have. This is, an inf this is an informational meeting. It is not intended to actually be collecting comments on the material that has been presented at this stage. Uh, that information on how to provide those comments will be given out during the rest of this meeting. Uh, we have several uh, members of the public here in the room. What we will do is Dr. Howe will give a presentation. Uh, we'll pause uh, at uh, several points during the meeting to ask uh, to give the public an opportunity to ask questions. Again, this is about the information on the Federal Register notice, or it's about how to supply the information. Uh, and again, if you are giving uh, providing comments back, we will ask that you, you utilize the appropriate process for doing that. Uh, for those folks that are here in the room, if there is, and this is the administrative portion of the meeting, uh, if there is any reason that for uh, that uh, fire alarm or something else goes off, uh, we'll pause the meeting, uh, ask you to follow us out the room, uh, and we'll continue from there at that point. Okay. At this point, uh, time, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Donna Beth Howe. Thank you. Um, that's not the first one I had, Gretchen. Excellent. Oh. That was the first one that I had. Yeah, oh. that's the first one. It should be there. It's not number two? There's one before that. Okay. Um, well, it's not really necessary. Um, the first thing is, what is what sodium iodide-131 treatments are we going to be covering in our information collection? And this is all about the information collection that we published in the Federal Register back in November 14th. And so we are expecting to uh, receive information ba back on treatments of either hypothyroid or thyroid carcinoma uh, patients. So it covers... Uh, any sodium iodide um, treatment that requires, in our terms, a written directive so it's large enough that, that um, we want to keep track of it. So that's going to be both for hyperthyroid and thyroid carcinoma. Can you switch to the next slide? My apologies, uh, we are still having some technical difficulties here. Please hold. Thank you. 
Well, we'll just have to proceed without the slides. The slide, uh, if you've got the Federal Register notice, you have the information, uh, the basic information that we're going to be talking about, and I'm just going to be hitting some of, of the highlights. Uh, the next question is, who do we want to receive information from? And we're really trying to get a, a very large number of, a very vari wide variety of stakeholders. And I... Not that one. It's got to be that one. It's only showing two slides. The, my, something happened to my slides. I had them this morning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and so who are we looking to get information from? Well, we're looking to, to get information from uh, patients. We're looking for patient advocacy groups. We're looking for individual physicians. We're looking for medical facilities that use I-131. We're looking for the professional organizations, the agreement states, our ACMUI members, and in any other interested individuals. And most of the questions that we have are about making information clear and consistent for patients, so we really do want to hear the uh, patient perspective from this. And what are we going to be asking for? We're going to be asking for existing information. So if you're a licensee, we're asking you for your procedures and processes that you already have. Uh, if you're a patient, we're asking you for your experience. And um, so we're asking for existing information. We're not asking anybody to generate any new data, new information, go off and do any research projects. We're really looking to see what is practical and what works for you. Um, the information in the form of, can be provided in the form of websites and links to websites in the form of procedures and processes that you uh, may be used and that you recommend for others. And as I said earlier, it's going to be your personal experiences either in your practice or as a patient. What are we collecting? What information are we collecting? Well, if you look in the Federal Register Notice, you'll see there are four main topics. And just in summary, the, the first one deals with information that is responsive to patient concerns about the medical treatment involving the use of I-131. Uh, the second um, point is the information the physicians use to make decisions on when it's safe to release I-131 patients. And this is kind of the dialogue that we're expecting, that everybody expects between the physicians or the licensee and the patient to determine, yes, the patient can be released immediately, no, they have to be held for a small period of time, or they have to be held longer. And then once the patient is getting ready to be released, it's the radiation safety information that's to be used by patients once they are released to keep doses to others as low as possible. And finally, we're looking to see if there is a brochure that is available for nationwide distribution that has to do with um, patient release for I-131 patients. Uh, the next question is, how do you submit information to NRC? As, as my facilitator has indicated to you, we are not collecting information at this point. We're just trying to answer your questions and clarify what we, what we wrote in the Federal Register. Information can be submitted to us electronically. And there's, in the Federal Register, you'll see that the electronic information should come to us through HTTP www.regulations.gov, and then you have to search on a specific docket number. That docket number is very specific to this particular information collection. You can also, if you're not, uh, if you have problems. You need to give them the docket number. Uh, the docket number is NRC 20150020. You can also mail the NRC, and there's a mail address. You would send it to Cindy Bladley, uh, Mail Stop 1 White Flint, 
12H08, U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Washington, D.C., 20555- well, I don't think you need the extra numbers. But so you can send information to us either electronically or by mail. If you have questions, you can send your questions on the electronic submission to Carol Gallagher. The telephone number for her is 301-415-3463. That number is also in the Federal Register. Or you can email her, and her email address is carol.gallagher at nrc.gov, and that information is also in the Federal Register. Any technical clarifications or questions, you should send to me. And my telephone number is 301-415-7848, or my email address, Donna Beth, D-O-N-N-A hyphen, B-E-T-H, period, H-O-W-E, at nrc.gov. So those are the, the basic elements of um, how to submit information, what we're looking for in general terms, and the fact that we aren't looking for any new information. Now I'll move on to the first of our four components or parts of our information collection, and that is the website. The first one I, I told you about was where we were looking for information that the patients uh, would want to have to know about their treatment and um, and what's ahead for them. So the for the website information, we're looking for the public and patients to identify websites that provide potential patients with information on the radioactive iodine treatment procedures so the patients will understand the medical condition, the reason for the I-131 procedure, the processes, and how to reduce radiation exposure to others. Now, in the Federal Register, we provided a list, and the list are suggested topics. It's not intended to be a complete list, nor is it intended to be the best list. So if you are looking through the Federal Register, you'll see that every time we provide a list, we ask people, is this list Correct. Is there something you would like to see taken off the list? Is there something you would like to see added to the list? It's clear to us when you're going to add something to the list that you think it would be beneficial. It would be helpful for us to know if, you're going, if you want something taken off of the list that you tell us why you think it's not important to be there. It was our first approximation to give you some suggested topics. And when you are submitting information to us, what, what do we want to see? Well, we want to see you identify a website. But sometimes just identifying a website is just too big. In other words, I, if I sent you to the NRC website, there's lots of information on it, and you might not know exactly how to get to what you're looking for. So we would like to have you indicate the topic that you think the website is going to address and also provide a link to that specific information on the topic so that we can go back and look at the information. And we can make it clear for people that are looking at it later. And that, uh, that completes my initial discussion on the web. Thank you, Dr. Howe. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and uh, take some questions at this time, if we have any. Before we do so, I'd like to um, Focus everyone on the Federal Register notice Dr. Hell uh, referenced in this. Uh, that is Federal Register Volume 80, Number 220, dated Monday, November 16th, 2015. It starts on page 70843. And if you take a look at the right hand column of three, you will see at the bottom of that addresses. Uh, it includes uh, Ms. Gallagher's. Uh, and also Cindy Blady uh, from the Office of Administration, uh, and also Dr. Howe on the following page, 70844, uh, so that if you did not get a chance to write down the information that was provided just momentarily, uh, just a moment ago, uh, that, that information is available again on page 70843 following in the Federal Register. At this time, uh, I'd like to 
uh, open the uh, floor to questions. Uh, we'll start here in the room. Uh, once we have had a chance to go around the room, then we'll go to the operator. Questions in the room? No questions in the room. Operator, any questions online? Participants on the phone, if you'd like to ask a question at this time, please press star 1 and record your name. One moment, speakers, for incoming questions. Thank you. Our first question comes from Peter Crane. Your line is open. Um, thank you very much. I don't think I had a question. I thought I was just supposed to uh, indicate that I wanted to participate in the meeting. So I have no question at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and by the way, if uh, anybody on the telephone line or here in the room uh, wishes to ask a question anonymously, uh, you do not have to give your name uh, in when you indicate with the star one. Next question. No questions online? I'm sorry, no questions in the queue. Okay. And in that case, we will go to the next section on the presentation. Dr. Allen. Okay. So the, the first part of it in a time sequence was essentially once the patient finds out that they are going to have a treatment and the information that they want to know. The second part of our information collection is the patient now knows they're going to have this procedure and they're working with the licensee and the licensee, whether it's the individual physician or someone at the licensee's site, is talking to the patient and getting basic information that affects um, that they will be using to decide when to release the patient. And we've used um, a header, and that's the second header that you'll see in the Federal Register Notice, and that's uh, Patient Licensee Acknowledgement Form and Best Practices in Making Informed Decisions on Releasing Patients. So we're, we're looking at the best practices that are used by individual physicians and licensees that focus on enhancing the ability to make informed radiation safety decisions on when to release patients from their radiation safety control. So in this case, you may be following a national guideline, but you may have to modify it to meet the situation for your particular practice. Uh, and so we're interested in, in, in how you modify things to meet your practice and, and what you think really works well for you as to collecting inform getting information from the patients and releasing them in a timely manner. So we are asking you to describe the policy or provide the procedure that provides confidence that the patients are released at the appropriate time. If applicable and you have a form that is signed by both the patient and the licensee that acknowledges that these topics were covered uh, and understood, then we would like to see that form if you have one. We're not asking anybody to generate a form. We're just saying if you've got one, please share it with us. Um, we're, also gonna, we're also asking, we've given a number of topics that we think might be topics that are discussed. Once again, we're saying this is our suggested topics. If you've got topics you think are much more important, please tell us that. If you think our topics are not important at all, then let us know and let us know why you don't think they're uh, important. We're also asked a few timing questions. In this case, when is the best time to have this discussion between the licensee and the patient? And uh, we're looking from the patient's perspective, and we also want to find out from the licensee's perspective. We've also asked that patients and other interested individuals give their perspective on the, the topics that uh, they think are important for this discussion, and again, the timeline. So that's the general kind of information that we're asking for. And at this point, I can open it up to, to questions. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Al. Um, again, the topics that we're discussing now are the ones uh, on page 70845 of the Federal Register. It's under uh, the first column, uh, B. Um, since we went to the room first time, we'll go to the phones this time. Uh, operator, anyone on the phones? Thank you, speakers. We have three questions in queue. The next question comes from Linda Croker. You may begin. 
Um, sorry, mine was a little bit maybe more related to the first section, but I didn't queue fast enough, I guess. Um, That's perfectly fine. Go ahead. So relative to the, um, your desire for suggestions for websites, um, the concern would be that it's such a fluid environment, um, and if it gets put into, say, a rewrite of 1556 or, or elsewhere, how is that going to be maintained so that, um, because, you know, websites are updated very quickly, much more quickly than, than things usually are updated by, say, the NRC? Our intent is not to put the website locations in a guidance document. Our intent is to develop an NRC website that has links to the information so that that could be much more fluid and up-to-date and, and could be monitored. Thank you. Next question. Our next question comes from Dr. Carol Marcus. You may begin. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, much of the information that is given to patients is verbal and is uh, not one-size-fits-all information, but information that suits the patient's perspective, the patient's education, the, the patient's ability to research anything or even read. Um, and the NRC concept that all of this should be written down somewhere, I think really misses what is essential, which is a personal approach to each patient, depending on their um, ability to use media, ability to understand. Um, and this really cannot be in a one-size-fits-all document. Thank you, Dr. Marcus. Um, I think we understand that uh, medical practice is not a one-size-fits-all, and we are assuming that even if there is not specific information that is repeated to every patient, but that it is more tailored to the patient, that there are certain um, more or less performance guidelines that, that key uh, the licensee and the patient to certain discussion items. And so when we ask for best practices, and procedures, we, uh, we understand that they may not be written procedures, but the best practices might be general guidelines of what kind of things need to be discussed. And then we understand that independent decisions are made based on that dialogue back and forth. So we do not think there's going to be a one-size-fits-all. That's one reason many of our regulations are performance-based. Uh, even though it sounds like we're looking for prescriptive information, we understand that we tend to give guidance in performance base, and so if the, your response would be in performance base, then that would be fine. Did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, speakers. Our next question comes from William Lorenzen. Your line is now open. Yes, I wonder if you just clarify specifically what types of therapies are you or procedures are you looking to have addressed in this request? Is it all IRB related use of I-131 as well as clinical practice? We're looking for clinical practice with sodium iodide I-131. We're looking for treatments uh, for hyperthyroidism and for thyroid carcinoma treatments that require high enough amounts of iodine that a written directive has to be developed. And that may be jargon to members of the general public, but that means that the amount of activity is specifically written for a patient so that we make sure that a patient that's supposed to get a very small amount doesn't get a very large amount of sodium iodide. Does that answer your question? I just want to make sure it's clear. It does include investigational uses of I-131 covered under a written directive. Covered under a written directive. But it's, it's not just I-131. It's sodium iodide, I-131. So there are some iodine-labeled materials where the iodine stays pretty well bound to the material, so it doesn't function quite the same way, and it's not used for, uh, or you might even block the thyroid to have the material go somewhere else. So... 
it's, it's primarily material that's going to be going to the thyroid or thyroid-like tissue. That's very helpful. Thank you. There are no other questions in the queue. Okay. Thank you, operator. In the room. Um, I have one question. My name is Eric Munger. Um, some Can you push in the, make sure there's a green dot? It is a green dot. Okay. okay speak. Um, um, some of the administrations are performed on an outpatient basis, and some patients are isolated for a period of time before released. Would there be um, any measures for distinguishing uh, the advice that you'd be giving to the patients based on those two methods of release? The reason I ask is because a lot of people who are isolated will do research online and then get nervous when they see the restrictions that are recommended for those being given outpatient um, doses. Uh, interesting point. We uh, we didn't distinguish between the, and this actually gets into the the next topic because this particular topic is making the decision as to whether to release someone immediately, hold them for a few hours, or isolate them at the medical facility. Uh, but when we get to the next one, it is the guidance that you provide the patient once they are released. And so if you've held them for a number of days and then you release them, that guidance is, guidance is different than if somebody treats them as an outpatient, sends them home right away. Um, and we haven't specified that you need to clarify which it is. So that was a, a good question. I think it's important because people that are being held will oftentimes ask about whether or not they should check themselves into hotels or avoid their family unnecessarily because they're reading recommendations that were that are normally given to outpatients. Okay. <clears throat> any other questions? One more time. Any other questions, uh, operator on the line? We have a question from Peter Crane. You may begin. Yes, please. Uh, part of this goes back to the previous. How large a dose are we talking about for a threshold? Because I know some therapeutic doses can be as much as ten millicuries. Some diagnostic doses. Um, the activity. Uh, we did not put a threshold on the activity. Um, a lot of, I've gotten a few comments back. Uh, one person was concerned that they thought this covered only the thyroid carcinoma patients, and they wanted to make sure that we were also addressing the, the hyperthyroid patients as to whether, when it's safe to release them. The threshold for release is a dose to members of the public, so it is not uh, an activity. And I've gotten other information already from, from physicians which are covering both hyperthyroid and thyroid carcinoma patients. So uh, to answer your question, there is not an activity um, cutoff. Well, there is kind of an activity cutoff. You have to have a written directive. So it's not the very small diagnostic tests. If you have a written directive, those are the patients we're, we're looking for you to give us information on. The, uh, for diagnostic, it kicks in at 30 microcuries. And the reason it kicks in at 30 microcuries was a very long time ago, people had problems between writing microcuries and millicuries. And so we wanted to make sure that people that were getting microcuries got microcuries and people getting millicuries got millicuries. And most of the microcury uh, diagnostic <coughs> tests are below 30 microcuries. So that was where the, the line was set for the written directive. Okay. So in that case, an awful lot of diagnostic doses uh, for any <coughs> thyroid carcinoma patient would be in the written directive uh, uh, bailiwick, right? Um, some of the initial tests might be in the microcury level, but then when you get to whole body scans, uh, they, would, they would be in the written directive area. And, you know, the, the licensee can, can look at what they're giving and who they're giving it to and the expected doses to members of the public to determine whether they need to uh, provide information, hold them, or, or release them immediately. Okay. If I could just move on to a couple of other uh, points or questions. One, I take it that it's all right to refer to international uh, uh, guidelines, things used in other countries as, as guidance? 
Um, Peter, what we're pretty much looking for at this point is we're looking for people's individual experience. What is it you're using if you're a medical facility or a physician to determine when to release patients? And we're also looking at the patient's individual experience as to I was one of these patients and I thought I had excellent information given to me and I want to have other people get the same information. I thought the information wasn't as good and I would have liked to have heard more about a certain area or a certain topic. So we're not looking for international standards. We are actually looking for uh, what people are doing to determine when to release patients and how they are presenting that information to the patients. Got it. And, and finally, well, two, two other things. One, the point was made on, by a caller about website fluidity. I got an example of that just this morning as I was looking for, some, uh, for a presentation by a couple of MD Anderson people, uh, which I thought was excellent. And it had vanished from the website in the meantime because uh, the particular organization had updated its site. I, I have it, but it's, but it's gone. So things do come and go. And sometimes it's useful to print things out and send them in whole just to guarantee that it's still there when you want it. And finally, if I could respond to Dr. Marcus's point, she's quite right that one size fits all is not a workable model. But I think it's sometimes true that the people who work for fine institutions, and I would put uh, Dr. Marcus's in that uh, category, don't recognize that down at the level where a lot of patients get treatment, standards are not that high. And if I understand correctly, what the NRC is getting at is that we want to have some kind of baseline that can then be supplemented by uh, individual uh, uh, regard for the patient's situation, not that this is to take the place of the individualized discussion that she thinks is so necessary. Am I correct in that? Um. I think basically we, we, we are looking for the individual physician's experience. And so if they've got a diverse population, then they're going to do things a little bit differently than somebody that has a uniform population. If they've got a population that doesn't necessarily read English or, or, or speak English, then they're going to do things a little bit differently. And that's what we're kind of looking for. Okay. Thank you very much, Donna You're welcome. Any other questions online? We have another question from Linda Kroger. You may begin. I just want to get back to um, your mentioning of the um, the term written directive um, so many times, and and just I think in in practice that that is maybe going to be confusing because of the fact that in the summary statement at the beginning of the, uh, the on page seven zero eight four three. It mentions medical treatment with I-131, and then in the section we're talking about right now, section B under the licensee and patient acknowledgement, it's the treatment with I-131. And a written directive, as you already mentioned, goes down to 30 microcuries. So there is quite a bit of I-131 use um, in diagnostics that requires a written directive that is not treatment. And so I believe that this focus is on only the tr treatment the use of I-131 for treatment of, of patients, not the use of I-131, though it might require a written directive, in the diagnostic range, correct? Well, I think the starting point is that it requires a written directive. The second point is that patients are released if they can meet criteria that for doses to members of the public that um, are covered under the patient release criteria in 3575. So you've got both uh, parts going together. And so that means a lot of the diagnostic is not going to rise to the point where you're going to expect to give 100 millirem to the, the most, to the person that is going to receive the highest dose. And so you would not be providing instructions. So we're looking at those patients that have to be released with instructions or have to be held before they can be released with instructions or with written, uh, either oral or written instructions. So both, both things come together, and that eliminates many of the smaller activity uh, procedures. 
Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Because I shared no other questions at this time. Thank you. Okay, going on to the next session. Yes, the um, I'm sorry, before you do, uh, I think we've resolved our technical problems. I hope at this time that people who are tuned into the webcast can now see the presentation. Uh, if there is anyone who is on the webcast, if they could uh, so indicate uh, star one, I believe it is, to that they are seeing slide 13, best practices. I guess nobody is on the webcast. Okay, we'll continue on. Uh, next slide. The third component is guidance for release patients. So in the time frame, this is the point at which you are, are going to re be releasing your patient, whether it's immediately after the treatment or uh, after you've held them for a few hours or maybe you've held them in a, in a hospital. And uh, the question is, um, what guidance will you provide to them? And the next question is going to be, at what time is the best time to provide this, this guidance? So if we look at the um, next slide, uh, we were asked to provide standardized guidance to reduce the variability of instructions provided to patients and eliminate some of the uncertainty in the type of information provided. That can be one of two forms. It could be prescriptive, which would be very specific information. And as Dr. Marcus pointed out, that may not be the most appropriate way of providing guidance because that would assume one size fits all. So we have another option, and that is performance-based guidance. And if we go to the performance-based guidance, then we're going to be interested in the tools, the methods or means, that the licensee provides to the individual patients so that they can follow the guidance objectives and they can protect others. Next slide. So what are we expecting for information? If you've got guidance documents that you believe provide clear instructions for released patients, we're interested in seeing your guidance documents. Uh, we're interested in patient input as to what those instructions should look like to them. Were they easy to understand and follow? And what would have made them better? And when should the instructions have been provided? We once again have kind of a list in the Federal Register that again is a suggested list of topics and questions. And we are always asking in an open-ended manner that if you think those, those topics and guidance are are good, that's, that's fine. If you think something else should be added to it, tell us and tell us why. If you think something should be removed, then tell us and tell us why. Because uh, we want to make sure that our guidance, however we develop it, is going to hit the real important points. And we may or may not have included all of them in our list in the Federal Register. So we're interested in that input. And now we can go to questions. Okay. Um, very good. For those who are following along in the Federal Register, we are on page 70845, uh, item C, center column, bottom of the page. Um, start here in the room. Any questions in the room? Okay. No questions in the room? On the telephone, please. I think, excuse me, speakers, we had eight indicate activity on the webcast. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one and record your name. So eight people watching. Okay. If we have eight people, go ahead with the first one. Okay, our next question comes from Peter Crane. You may begin. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting confused by these instructions. Earlier it said uh, if anybody is following on the webcast, please press star one, and I did so just to say yes. It's all coming through loud and clear, but it doesn't mean I've got a question. Okay, well, thank you very much for letting us know that you're following it. I take it that you can see the material on the webcast? Dr. Crane? Yes. Okay. I can see it. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Did you have no other questions at this time? Do I have any questions? No, I don't. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, keying back in. Next uh, questioner. Our next question comes from Mike Wellings. Your line is open. No questions. Same comment as Dr. Crane. Thank you. No questions in the queue, speakers. So no other questions online? 
no questions at the moment. Thank you very much. Going on to the next section. Our next section is probably the shortest section of all, and that is next slide. And that is a brochure for nationwide use. And uh, the commission wanted to know if there was a brochure that um, explained the radiation safety and concerns for I-131 patient release, and whether it was, um, if there is one, whether it could be distributed for nationwide use. So we are asking people if there is such a brochure and if there is such a brochure for them to please provide us either with a copy or a link if it's located on a website. And um, that's our, our fourth. Um, and so identify the brochure that you believe provides clear guidance and provide us with a copy or a link to it. Open for questions. Okay. Um, no questions in the room. Uh, operator? I'm sharing no questions over the phone lines. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in, our next, in the closing remarks, uh, next slide, if you're watching on the webcast um, and if you've got your Federal Register, submissions for this information collection are due to the NRC on February 16, 2016. Uh, you are highly recommended to get them in before February 16th. If you're a little bit late, we, still, we have discretion as to whether we take that information or not. So February 16th is a date for sub submissions. We, this is the first of two public meetings. The next one is a public workshop where we're expecting more uh, conversation and dialogue between people that are coming to the workshop or people that are going to be participating at the wor workshop through the web webcast and the telephone lines. It's also going to be on patient release. The purpose for our um, public meeting today is you the Federal Register notice has been out for about 30 days. If you're thinking about it, you might have some questions you want to ask us. Well, the next uh, public workshop, which will be January 21st, 2016, it will be all day from 9 o'clock to 4 o'clock. We'll have about an hour and a half for each one of our major topics. It will be webcast and there will be a telephone bridge line. And um, there will be about an hour and a half for each one of our major topics at that point. So it will be a much longer meeting. Next slide. And once again, I have repeated the information on how uh, who to ask questions on if you've got problems with your electronic submission. And sometimes people do have problems with the uh, electronic submissions, and Carol Gallagher is the one to contact. And I've got the information on this slide. It's also in the Federal Register notice. If you want technical clarification or questions, then I'm the one to contact, and my information is on this slide, and it's also in the Federal Register notice. So we want to make sure that if you've got any questions, that, that you get them in so that you will be able to submit information. And a reiteration again of how do you submit information to the NRC. Electronically, you go onto the regulations.gov website. You search for our docket number, which is NRC 2015-0020, and you have uh, an electronic mechanism where they ask you to, to provide your comments. Sometimes that can be frustrating. Uh, if you aren't comfortable with electronic submissions, then you can always mail uh, information to us, to Cindy ba Bladley, at Office of Administration, here at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That information is in the Federal Register, and it is also on this slide. Are there any other questions? Okay. No questions in the room? Going to the operator. Uh, any questions online, please? We have a follow-up question from Dr. Kara Marcus. You may begin. Thank you. Um, uh, Donna Beth, at the time that 35.75 was being discussed and, and uh, uh, being worked on, um, you received the brochure that the Society of Nuclear Medicine uh, makes available. Do you still have that? I mean, the, the, the guy's general, not 
patient specific, but it certainly covers a lot of the things you're talking about and is being used, I think, by many, at least board certified nuclear medicine physicians as uh, uh, extra written information to augment their verbal information to the patient. Uh, we have a brochure that is much older than that that was done, um, I believe, in probably the 87 rule that was more of a pamphlet to, to be passed out. Um, and we put that, I, I think, on our, we disseminated that. Um, there, it may be the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging provides us with a brochure that they believe is is good for everybody, and and there may be other uh, groups or individuals that have uh, pamphlets. So so we're looking for um, information from whoever has a pamphlet that they believe would be good, Carol. Okay. Any other questions online? I'm showing no questions in the queue. Okay. Uh, seeing none in the room, uh, barring no other ones uh, on the telephone, I'd like to uh, redirect your attention to the uh, information uh, that's uh, available on your screen right now. Uh, that is, again, who to contact if you have any additional questions. Uh, Carol Gallagher uh, and Donna Beth Howe for technical clarifications. Uh, at this time... Okay. Um, there, as mentioned earlier, the public meeting on January 21st is going to be located? It's going to be located in exactly the same room that we're in now, and we're going to have a webcast, and the telephone bridge lines are going to be exactly the same as the bridge lines we have now. I'll be posting that meeting notice uh, in the next day or two on the NRC website so that it'll be available for everyone, and we'll publish the uh, agenda, which will look very similar to the agenda that you saw for today, but with longer time periods. And again, the location uh, for the January 21st is here at the uh, White Flint Complex uh, in Rockville, Maryland, for those of you who care to travel. Uh, but as uh, Dr. House said, we will have a webcast and a telephone bridge line for those who uh, opt not to. Um, so one last time. One more point. I'm sorry. In the case of inclement weather, because one can never predict what's going to happen in January in D.C., uh, if we have snow or some other reason that we're not able to come into the office, we will still hold the meeting via the telephone conference line because you need to get your information in by the 16th of February, and we won't have an opportunity for another meeting uh, between the 21st of January and the 16th. And for those of you who are not here on the East Coast where we are having spring-like weather, um, I envy you your snow. Uh, but other than that, yes, we, we always have the challenges of weather at uh, that time of the year. Um, one last opportunity for questions. Anyone on the telephone? We have a question from Sophie. You may begin. Hey, Donna Beth, I did have a question. Sophie, you're breaking up. Oh. Can you hear me better now? Yes, I can hear you better. Okay. I was going to say I wanted to take the opportunity or to remind you to let people know that we'll have meeting transcripts available in the event that they weren't able to attend or they couldn't hear the full portion of the meeting. Okay. Thank you, Sophie. Yes, we will. Okay. Any other questions? We do. We have a second question in the queue. It comes from Peter Crane. You may begin. Yes, please. Um, just to respond to Dr. Marcus's point, I think she's referring to the brochure that was prepared jointly by the SNM and the NRC in, published in 1987. The author of that was the late Dr. David Becker of Cornell Weill Medical Center, and it was very useful in its time, but that was in the days of the 30 millicurie rule, and when the NRC published its uh, 35.75 rule change in 1997, it said that you could use that, uh, but just adjust. And the question is, it, it adjust the times according to the number of millicuries and so forth. And the question is, does that really tell licensees very much if you've got uh, a 200 millicurie dose and you've got instructions that are appropriate to uh, a 30 millicurie dose. 
uh, how do you how do you make the uh, transition? And my own view is that a new and updated brochure uh, of that obsolete one is long overdue. Thank you, Peter. That's also another reason why we're asking for uh, information collection today to find out what people are using. Last call for questions. One moment, speakers, for additional questions from the phone. Our next question comes from Bill Irwin. Your line is open. Uh, hi, this is Bill Irwin from MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, uh, this is more of a comment than a question. The um, SNMMI has an updated procedure uh, procedure guidelines for various types of procedures, in, including uh, treatment of thyroid cancer and hyperthyroidism, which is dated 2012. So they have updated that. It's a little more current, so it may still be a useful uh, document. It's not so outdated. And we assume that, uh, that the Society of Nuclear Medicine and MMI will, will send us a link or a copy of that. Uh, the link, if you just go to their web page and look under the practice standards, it's available for public consumption. There's a link right there. It's, you've got to drill down just a couple levels, but it is there. Thank you for your comment. Excuse me, speakers. We have a follow-up statement from Ms. Car from Dr. Carol Marcus. You may begin. Uh, Dr. Irwin said what I was going to say, basically. Thank you. And I'm showing no other questions in the queue. No other questions? No other questions, sir. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, at that time, I'd like to go ahead and wrap up the meeting. As was said uh, earlier, we will have a transcript of the meeting that will be published uh, here in the uh, very near future. Uh, there, Dr. Howe will be also providing additional information regarding the public meeting on January 21st. Uh, in the meantime, if you do have any questions regarding electronic submission or any technical cl clarifications, uh, the names on the screen, uh, Carol Gallagher for electronic submission and Dr. Donabeth Howe for technical clarifications uh, are available to you. And with that, good. I think we're good. With that, we're good. And I thank everyone for their participation. And I wish all a happy holidays and a very happy 2016. Thank you very much. And the meeting is closed. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.